On this edition of Native Report, we visit the Tontaquidgen Indian Museum in Uncasville, Connecticut. We learn the history of the North American Indian Center of Boston. And we celebrate the life of the late Charlie Hill. Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? We also learn something new about Indian Country and hear from our elders on this Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community and the Blandon Foundation. Welcome to Native Report, I'm Stacy Thunder. The Tontaquidgen Indian Museum is the oldest Native American run museum in the United States. Operated by the Mohegan Tribe of Connecticut, the museum houses a collection of artifacts and objects from across the continent. This stone lodge on the Mohegan Indian Reservation is the Tontaquidgen Indian Museum which houses a collection of Mohegan and other Native American artifacts. It is dedicated to the ideal of education. Welcome to the Tanaquidgen Museum. It was built in 1931 by John and Harold Tanaquidgen. They um, had housed a lot of these articles that are in this museum in their home, and so they decided they wanted to build a museum and present their viewpoints to the public so they would get to know them better. And it was a good thing they did because two years after they moved all the articles up here, their house burnt down. This particular room houses Mohegan items for the most part. We also have some Mohegans and um, northern um, coastal Indian items in that one. And the other room is what we call the Southwest Room, and it houses items from the West, Southwest, and some South American items. This is what we call our um, leaders board, um, sort of, and there's a lot of chiefs up here and important people to our tribes, including women. Um, they were all artisans. Um, some of the carvings, this one particular one, I was mentioning the fire. Um, my grandfather had saved one of the beams from that and carved this and donated this to the museum. He also did some beadwork. Um, this was from Chief Mataga. He did um, a lot of utensils and these were typical wedding presents that they would present to the brides. Looking at these items, it reminds me of the way things used to be. Um, we've changed so rapidly with the um, onset of the gaming that things have just progressed. Um, this reminds me of the old times when you would sit around and you would actually have conversations with people and you know do crafts together. Obviously my grandfather's items are very important to me too because he's actually, these earrings came from my father who got his education about beating from my grandfather so it's all connected somehow. The Mohegan hold their chiefs and sachems in high regard. A statue garden honors their memory. The medicine women also hold a special place in Mohegan culture. In one corner of the lodge stands a wood carving in the likeness of Gladys Tantaquidgen, co-founder of the museum. I'm standing in front of my great aunt, Gladys Tantaquidgen, who lived from 1899 to 2005. She was 106 when she passed on and she led her people through most of the 20th century as a medicine woman and also uh, as a member of the tribal council in, in, in many different capacities. She learned from her traditional elders. When she was a small child, she was selected. They actually called her everyone's grandmother, uh, Nana Skidenbach, because she was the type of child who really captured the imagination of the older people. Uh, and they felt that she would do great things. The carving of Gladys is really an interesting piece. It's made of a single piece of basswood, which is a sacred tree to us. It's called weak up in our language because it's a cure-all, it heals, which is in many ways what Gladys herself was like. She was a, a healing kind of a personality, a good-spirited person. Gladys' belt is a very interesting piece. It comes from a time before the American Revolution. And what's interesting about it is it was only worn by three women. They had such longevity. Martha Uncas passed it on to Fidelia Fielding. These are Mohegan women. Fidelia Fielding's Indian name was Flying Bird, and Flying Bird passed it on to Gladys. 
And so Gladys died in 2005, and this belt, which was only owned by three women, came into existence in 1769. So with it went many of our stories with the belt, and that's why it's such an important piece of our culture. Gladys is holding a small basket, which also has significance because it relates to offerings that we give to some of the spirits who are important to us. And her clothing, again, is, is Eastern Woodland design. She's a tiny, tiny lady. In the yard adjacent to the museum is a replicated Mohegan village that features a traditionally framed wigwam and longhouse. This longhouse and a wigwam, longhouse tended to have two or three families. In this area, they could be up to 60 feet long and house up to 12 families. Every family had their own fire pot and their own beds. They're made out of poplar, which is the outside bark, and the inside structure is swamp cedar. And they take the saplings and they have to dig down. Then you bend those saplings, cross them over time together, so then you have that structure that you attach the bark to, and then the outer rings hold the bark into place. Um, they're very well made. Um, in the summertime, they're very cool. If you put the mats on the inside, it's like air conditioning with the air circulating. And in the winter, that's just like you're having heating in your house and it keeps the wigwams warm. I think this village adds a lot because now we have an outside attraction as well. And a lot of people don't even come into the museum. They will just come and look around the village and sit up here. We're on Mohegan Hill. Um, a lot of the Mohegans lived in this area. Um, that were, you know, it was not just on this area, but in this general area, this is where we all lived. I lived across the street, and like I said, my grandfather lived on the other side of the museum. So every day I would walk through this path to go to my grandfather's or my grandmother's house. And Harold or Gladys or Ruth would grab me every single day and show me something, you know, that was related to something in here. So this is what we have. You can't just replace any of these items. So it's our heritage and our culture. Did you know that the state of Massachusetts is named after an Indian tribe? Massachusetts is a tribe of Native Americans who historically lived in what is now Greater Boston. Tribal members spoke a language that is part of the Algonquin family. The present day U.S. state is named after the tribe. Alternative forms of the name are Maswet-Usit, where Miles Standish and Squanto first met tribal leaders in 1621. Massachusetts translates from the Algonquin as the people who live near the Great Hill, while Maswet Usit translates to the hill shaped like an arrowhead. This is thought to refer to the Blue Hills located south of Boston. As one of the first groups of indigenous American peoples to encounter English colonists, the Massachusetts had a rapid decline in population in the 17th and 18th centuries due to new infectious diseases. Descendants of the tribe continue to inhabit the greater Boston area, but it is not a federally recognized tribe. The North American Indian Center of Boston began in 1970 as the Boston Indian Council and was organized as a nonprofit in 1992. They provide a modest number of services to Native Americans in a nine-county area, but more importantly, they provide a gathering place for all nations. A few miles west of historic downtown Boston is the North American Indian Center of Boston. It was on October 20th, 1970, when the center was incorporated. This is the oldest urban Indian center in the Northeast. Uh, we were meeting in the 60s, 1960s, right across the street from the uh, Boston Commons. Uh, there were a handful of Indians because we realized Indians, this is not like other places where you're going to find a lot of Indians in one place. For example, Boston is a neighborhood kind of city. For us, our numbers are so small we don't constitute enough people to have a neighborhood. So we're dispersed all over, all over the city. So this building represents who we are. It re represents who we are as a people. And if you look around the building, many, many different tribes here. Uh, the 70s was a very, very exciting time. We had Indians from everywhere. 
What is the first thing an urban does, or an Indian does when they hit the city? They look for an urban Indian center. They look for other Indians. I've lived here for quite a few years, since 63, and um, raised my family here and have been working at the Indian Center since um, I believe it was 78, quite a few years. Um, and it's been very important for me to be uh, involved with the Native community here. And I've been here as the Employment and Training Director of the North American Indian Center of Boston for a number of years. And um, we've helped a number of people find employment by educating, by training, and trying to help them keep those jobs. And we've worked with youth and, and um, people of all ages. And so it's important um, to me to make a difference for Indian people. At one time, the center had upward of 100 employees, but due to cutbacks, there is only a staff of five. However, the center still provides services to the region's Native American population. The people that are here in the city, they need training. Lots of times they need housing. They need social services. Uh, they need an advocate. I mean, one of the things is, yes, we, um, to lose the Indian Health Service contract did devastate us, but we're still here. Right now, I think we have just five employees, and uh, a lot of that happened with the, uh, over time, having the, you know, not just the federal recognition, but the loss of a contract that was over half a million dollars is hurting us. Now, we have lots of folks who help us and don't get paid. And I think you're only going to find that in Indian country. You're not going to find that in these big corporations that people put their whole heart and souls without getting any compensation whatsoever. We don't. My board in particular, our board of directors works very, very hard. They are not just um, figureheads. They work. Because without them working, we couldn't even uh, get this far. Joanne and Janice are also commissioners on the Massachusetts Commission on Indian Affairs. Both view their appointments as another way to serve the greater Boston Native American community. In Massachusetts, we have a number of um, Indian people separated. Uh, we have some of the tribes are here, but we also have just Indian people who have moved um, to Massachusetts for education or a number of, of different uh, reasons. The job of the commission is to help Native people in any way that's needed. It might be legal, uh, might be educational, might be health, but all of these issues come to the commission. And as commissioners, we discuss them and we deal with them and we advocate to, um, to the state government what might be a good solution for Native people. I'm not saying they always listen to us or take our advice. However, we're there to make sure that that advice is given. I represent the North American Indian Center on the commission. To have a place where Indians can come together and meet other Indians and, and just feel like you're connected. It's like family, you know, and that's, that's this place. I think the Creator blessed us in many ways too and saved us because indeed we are still here and we're challenged, but look how long we've been serving our people. You will always be welcomed here at 105 South Huntington Avenue. You will always be embraced and there'll always be a smile for you when you come through that front door. What these people have just done is uh, reenacted uh, this march back in November 7th through the 13th, 1862, when 1,700 of our people, primarily women and children, were force marched 150 miles from southwestern Minnesota around the Morton Redwood Falls area. 
150 miles to the concentration camp. And again, soldiers enforced this. We just got done there with that little ceremony where a lot of us were carrying like a twig with a, well, like a branch, I guess, with uh, ribbons on it. And on those, on the ribbons was names of known people who were on that march. And, uh, and the, the young people who are running it, they were very thoughtful and they knew that one of my relatives was Hazawi. Her name, and that means in English, blueberry woman. And uh, they gave me her, that, that uh, branch with the, with the name, with the ribbon on it to carry. And then in a circle, we were to put it down. And uh, anyway, uh, when I put it down, I just said, Kunshi, Azawi, Wopi, Tonka, Echichi, Do. Tears came to my eyes. I said, you know, Hazaway, Blueberry Woman, thank you so much for what you have done. Comedian Charlie Hill's first television appearance was on The Richard Pryor Show in 1977. He was also the first Native American comedian to appear on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Charlie wrote for television and appeared at venues all over the world until he passed away in 2013. Next, a legend and pioneer in comedy and an inspiration to many, Charlie Hill. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, it's been a great evening here and everything. And white folks, you were here two hours, not one incident. I'm so proud of you people. Because everywhere you go, lots of white people, there's always trouble. They got a little quiet in here, didn't they? Oh. And I'm just kidding, you're not white. You're all pink like raw hot dogs. You know? Indian is what I am and comedy is what I do. I've never called myself an Indian comedian, though some people say it, they mean it different, and the Indians say they mean it different than the nuns, and I mean whitey. Uh, 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 <laughs> what, 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 you know, that's something we never see in real life, non-Indian. We say it in polite academic discussions, but we never say it in real life. Look, look at those non-Indians over there by the pickup. We, we don't do that, you know. Any, anyway, uh, um, I've never called myself that. I don't mind they refer to me that. But you never say you're a Jewish attorney or a Negro athlete or so on. So, so I just, you know, Indian is what I am and comedy is what I do. And I'm, uh, you know, Seinfeld calls himself an a observation comic. So that's what I do, but I see it through native eyes. We can fix it because we have... The storytelling the tradition of native manual. cultures expresses the truth, wisdom, and the humor of human existence. Comedian Charlie Hill was a storyteller who related his life experiences to all audiences, but used humor as his medium. The war on terrorism? Hell, we've been fighting terrorism since 1492. Every comedian has a different point of view, whatever their background is in doing it. There's a lot of comedians that are cookie cutter and they all sound the same. Then there's ones that have their own unique thing. And I think the best ones are the ones that are real and true and, and, and like that. So, so I talk about my experiences through my point of view. And as I got older, I got bolder. And as I got older, I had more things to talk about. It, when I started, I was more blunt than funny. And, and, but when I got older, I started having family and more experience and I got more maturity to my, my delivery and everything. So I think if you grow as a person, you grow as anything else you do. But that's the idea of it. I think that Energizer Bunny must be Indian because he's got the little hand drum he uses all the time, you know? <laughs> I think when you talk to Indians, it's if you're Indian, you're talking to family. So when you talk in your family at the dinner table, you don't have to preface anything. You can go into a story about your brother and they know what you're talking about. With, with natives, our experiences, if I did a BIA joke in a club, they'd, boom, they wouldn't know what that meant. So if I'm in L.A., I might do a Hollywood Boulevard joke or an L.A. thing. I went to college five and a half years, folks, and I became a sophomore. I'll tell you, those years are really meaningful to me. 
You know how bad I did? I was probably the only Indian in history ever to flunk archery. I'll tell you, that's really embarrassing. Most Americans know Indians from the attitudes toward them. They don't know them. You know, when they were kids, they grew up playing cowboys and Indians, or they see us in objects that count, you know, 10 little Indians. That's why I, I sing 10 little whiteies when I do the shows, show them how stupid that is. And, and also, uh, uh, when you get them to laugh, then they connect. That's, that's really what I do. With, with, with Indian people, it's like talking to the family. With the nons, sometimes like talking to third graders because they don't know Indian people. And I think when, when white folks don't know Indians, then they don't know America because we're right in their faces. And after all these years, if they don't know us, how can they know anything more about their own science, their art, their own medicine, and what's good for people on the other side of the globe? Here we are, right there, and they're, they're still studying us. Well, white folks, you wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for Indian people. They wouldn't even be in America if it wasn't for us. You know, this is, would still be Europe Junior. And you came to this country, and we taught you how to survive. We taught you about democracy. We taught you how to fight the British so you could be free. Hide behind the trees! <laughs> Charlie did his time on the comedy circuit and stepped into the national spotlight by appearing on the Richard Pryor Show in 1977. Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? <laughs> I, um, usually have problems doing my act, you know, because I, uh, no, a lot of you white people never seen an Indian do stand-up comedy before, you know. Like, for so long, you probably thought that Indians never had a sense of humor, you know. We never thought you were too funny, either. <laughs> well, I learned my stuff at the comedy store. You know, right here's a plug, Mitzi. And, and, and uh, when I was in line with David Letterman, he had long hair and a beard, and Mike Douglas, who became Michael Keaton, and we all auditioned there at the same time. There was a, uh, God, everybody came out of there. Uh, Roseanne, much later after she came from Denver. Arsenio Hall, uh, uh, Leno came through there even though he was established in New York. But anybody you can think of come there and it's the toughest nightclub in the world. And you could be the biggest thing in, in uh, Chicago, Minneapolis, whatever, but you come to a comedy store, you're just another guy. So being young and not knowing better, I, was, I jumped into the deep water. And, and, I, and I learned how to do it, trial and error, that's how you do it. You train in bombing. And so when I, when I would uh, tape my stuff and listen to it, I would go, is this joke too offensive to them or they don't get it? Or is it just not a funny joke? And often it would be that. And also with comedians, we're real vulnerable and sometimes there's natural resentment. So when you see uh, uh, somebody in the room playing a guitar, most people don't, and oh, they listen, you got talent. But if you see somebody you never heard of standing there trying to talk, the, the natural thing is, hey, hey, honey, I can do that. Who's this guy? And then with comedians, when they don't like the comedian, they not only not like him, they hate the guy. You know, you know the, Bill Cosby, I hate that bastard. You know, you know, it's like, see, that's that's how it is. We're up there bearing our soul, and it goes right through it. You know, so that's kind of the stuff you deal with. And for years after that, I was paranoid. I'm glad that wore off tonight. Nothing would have been worse than a paranoid comedian. What are you laughing at? You know. Sadly, Charlie passed away on December 30th, 2013. But he paved a legendary and revolutionary path for every native comic. And his gentle ways and humor is missed by the friends, family, and audiences he leaves behind. A guy came up to me today, and he was just a, a right-wing lobbyist. And he came up to me, and a white man, and he said he really liked my show. And that just made me think, it's just if you got a sense of humor or not. It doesn't matter what you are. So, so I think that's cool. You know, you can believe in what you want, but if you're laughing together, then that breaks that barrier, you know. And I find if you got a sense of humor, it doesn't matter if you're native or not, it's if you have a sense of humor. So that's what I talk about in, in the stereotypes. We're the most stereotyped people in the world, I think. Power of the spirit, too, you know. That's African Americans. They, they're living proof, too. You can't extinguish the human spirit. And they brought us the blues. They taught us, you know. It's just like our stuff. You know, I met a guy before the show. He's really proud of his heritage. He says, Charlie, you know, my great-great-grandfather was African and... 
American, a Native American. I'm thinking, that poor bastard, they not only stole his land, they made him work on it for free. So. <laughs> thank you very much, folks. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us at nativereport.org, Facebook, and Twitter. Thank you for spending time with us here on Native Report. I'm Stacy Thunder. We'll see you again. Stacy Thunder is Ojibwe from the Red Lake and Lakota Ray Nations and is the legislative counsel for the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe. Professor Ted Johnson is the director of the Master of Tribal Administration and Governance program at the University of Minnesota Duluth and is an enrolled member of the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community and the Blandon Foundation. Closed captioning is provided by the Grand Portage Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. <laughs>